Great. Step on your level. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. This is a wonderful turnout. Um, and I'd like to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Culinary uh, Historians of Ann Arbor. This is actually our first in-person meeting uh, of 2023. And of course, I also want to say a big welcome to all the people who are watching us online, because even though this is a wonderful turnout, there are probably about two times as many people who are watching us online, including um, folks in England who are uh, big, <laughs> big fans of the culinary historians of Ann Arbor. Um, and we also, especially, uh, Jason's disappeared, but we really want to thank uh, the Ann Arbor um, Library for hosting today's program, um, not only making this nice meeting space available to us, but they also provide promotional and tech support when we are doing our meetings online. And uh, we've had to do a lot of those, obviously, during the pandemic. Um, you can also find uh, a lot of the recordings that they've done of our programs uh, on the Ann Arbor uh, Library's YouTube channel, which is AADLTV. So if you're a newcomer, if this is the first time that you've um, been to one of our meetings, we'd just like to give you a little background on the organization. Um, we are an informal group of, of people who are interested in the uh, history and the culture of food and cooking. And our group was founded in 1983, so this is our 40th anniversary year. But new members are always welcome. Uh, and we have monthly talks between September and May. And since the pandemic, most of those meetings, as I said, have been on Zoom, uh, thanks to the library, uh, but we are starting to add back some in-person meetings as well, like today's talk. Uh, and next month as well, we'll be here. Uh, we have twice yearly potluck theme meals, usually in July and December, and our December meal featured food from the British Isles. It was very fun and well attended. So if you're not a member of the Culinary Historians, we would love to have you join. Uh, our membership is just $25 a year, and that's for an individual or a family. And it includes a subscription to our quarterly magazine repast edited by Randy Schwartz here in the front row. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to join our group, you can find membership information on our website. It's culinaryhistoriansannarbor.org. Just click on membership. Uh, we're also on Facebook. You can search for Culinary Historians of Ann Arbor and like our page and then you'll get our news in your timeline. And now to introduce today's speakers. Lisa McDonald is the proprietor of Tea House, a tea store, tea room, and cafe in downtown Ann Arbor, and I'm sure most of the people here know it very well. The Tea House opened in December of 2007 and happily has survived the pandemic. Uh, Lisa is, yay. <laughs> Lisa is a European trained certified tea sommelier, one of just seven in the United States. She developed, <laughs> she developed her obsession with tea while living in Europe and working in intercultural communications. And lucky for us, she missed good tea when she returned to the US. So she opened her store. Her tea bar and lounge offer an opportunity for people to learn, shop, and enjoy. She's heavily invested in the community and she also provides free weekly meals at a shelter kitchen and donates her time, knowledge, and tea. Jill Reinheimer is an editor and graphic designer who writes a research-based blog about all things tea. It's morethantea.wordpress.com, uh, as well as uh, she does the educational uh, and marketing material for Tea House. Jill draws on her background in scientific research and written communication to make her tea-related research and history accessible to a general audience. She began her career in cell biology, then moved on to anthropology and archaeology. She's worked as both a volunteer and freelance writer, editor, photo editor, web and book designer. She's also written for World Tea News. In February, Lisa and Jill's book, Tea for Dummies, became one of the newest uh, in the well-known Wiley publishing series of instructional and informational books, and they have brought books to sell, which will be available after their talk. So welcome, Lisa and Jill. Thank you. All right. Dang, Jill's impressive. All right. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so we're just going to kind of do an overview of tea in general for you guys. We did bring a few teas for you guys to try at the end. Um, when we're talking about those specific teas, if you are thirsty, you're welcome to kind of go back there and just give yourself a little. Those of you who don't have cups, we passed out some cups in the beginning. 
Um, those of you who don't have cups, uh, Jill left a few back there. We're not allowed to leave the stage because our microphones will go what according to him. So you're going to have to get your own cups. No. <laughs> so, all right. So um, uh, like Linda had mentioned, we opened 15 years ago. I opened, uh, I originally am from Colorado. Um, I, do, I have a business degree in um, intercultural communications and negotiations, and I wanted to go backpacking in Europe after I finished um, when I graduated from the University of Colorado. And that three-month backpacking trip somehow accidentally became 15 years. Um, I was in Tübingen, which is um, ironically Ann Arbor's sister city, which at the time meant absolutely nothing to me. No offense. Um, <laughs> I had no idea what this M was. I was like, whatever. I don't know. Mullen, maybe? That was a private school in Denver. Maybe that was it. I don't know. But here I am. Um, I met my souvenir. I consider my husband my souvenir. I had a Ukrainian, um, a Ukrainian American husband that I met doing theater in a British theater company in Stuttgart, Germany. Because, of course, that's where you meet good Ukrainian American boys. <laughs> yeah. So he would argue that um, I am his souvenir, but I live there much longer than he is. So I'm saying he's my souvenir. But anyway, he's from it. He um, uh, was educated here in Ann Arbor. And so when we had our first child, we had our first son in Sweden. We thought, okay, maybe it's time to go back to the States. So we moved back and uh, I worked, I, I was a housewife for about, ooh, three weeks maybe? <laughs> Didn't last long. Um, so uh, we uh, ended up pregnant with our second son and he was born and three days later, Tea House was opened. So it was a really busy week, um, but 15 years ago, uh, all turned out okay and then at some point Jill her Jill's wonderful daughter was working for me while getting her master's in historic preservation from Eastern and uh, Jill was like oh god the university ah oh, I'm suffocating I'm like <laughs> want to join forces thank goodness I did because Jill can write I can think she can write too I can think <laughs> You make it pretty. Um, <laughs> so we decided to uh, start a blog, and Jill has been doing all of our posters and our educational materials. And then, like um, Linda mentioned, last April, I got what I thought was spam mail. Uh, turns out when Wiley Publishing writes you, it's not spam. <laughs> um, I put it in my spam box, thought it was phishing. Then they sent another email, and the third by the third email, I'm like, Jill, do you think this is real? And Jill's like, ah, I did Google. Mm, I don't know. It was, because here we are five months later and we have a book. So <laughs> if Wiley writes you, write back. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we had never sought out to write a book. Um, the blog, Jill's blog is amazing and we're just so busy with this store. It, it, but it happened and it was good timing because we were closed for the pandemic. We closed uh, March, uh, March 15th or 13th of 2020. Um, to transition and to pivot, oh, what a great word, uh, pivot into uh, providing five, three to 500 free meals a week um, in the Ann Arbor community, which we're still doing. Um, and then we did renovations and now we're open. So there you go. All right, so now let's talk about tea. Now you know about all about me and all about what we do. And so we're gonna talk, so really quick referencing a sommelier. I mean, at this point, I would say most of my staff would qualify as at least sommeliers by what we would consider a sommelier in the US. I mean, you can go to the World Tea Expo, pay $1,500 and become a tea sommelier in, a, in like five days. Um, in Europe, it's a little bit different. It's a four-year degree program. Um, you do two years of training and then you do two years of apprenticeship. Now, I thoroughly admit I did not do the two years of apprenticeship because the training was actually helping one of the largest tea purchasing and tea testing facilities design an international tea sommelier training program. So in that, I was then certified. Um, and then I have trained actually quite a few sommeliers since then. Uh, most of the other sommeliers in the U.S. wear like suits and tuxedos and white gloves when they serve the same exact tea I'm serving you in my jeans, just so you um, <laughs> I just am not a fancy dancy um, tea sommelier, but oh, I can bring it when I have to. <laughs> so <laughs> um, this is one of the Japanese, um, one of the Japanese farmers that I had the pleasure of visiting when the, our sister state, Shiga, invited me to do some consulting work in Japan a few years back. Um, we'll talk more about that. So Jill and I will talk uh, both about purity, testing, health, all that good stuff. Um, but I think it's really important that when we are presenting about tea, we're referring to a very small amount of tea that is available. What we're referring to is like the 0.5% of tea. So when I talk about tea, I'm not talking about anything you'd find in, gr in a grocery store. Um, I'm not talking about tea that you would find in a tea bag. I'm not talking about tea that you'd find on Amazon. So just to be aware that when we talk about tea, we're talking about something very different than what most people have every day in their lives. So it's about 0.5%. Um, what is tea? 
First, let me say, actually, I'm going to go back to this because this is really important. Sorry, all of you watching in Great Britain. Guess what? Germany is the largest tea purchasing country. Turkey is the largest tea drinking country. Iran, Iran is usually ranked around number two, and then we are usually ranked number three. England is like way down here. And they usually don't drink the 0.5% that we're discussing here today. So, um, All of my tea gets tested in Germany, unless I'm buying it directly from a garden that I have a personal relationship with. So for example, some of those gardens in Japan I was able to visit. Um, because Germany does require testing for all of their teas, they test for both pesticides and heavy metals. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever lived or worked with German scientists or engineers, and trust me, they're thorough. Um, there's a reason why I did not want to raise my kids there. Just joking, <laughs> kind of. Um, so all of our teas go through that testing, and that's really important to us. So uh, when you come in or you hear about you know, heavy metals or nuclear fallout, whatever, we're, our teas are going to be tested regardless, regardless if it's organically or conventionally grown. Um, I've been to plenty of organic tea gardens that are literally five feet away from the freeway. And I don't care how organic that is, it ain't clean. So that is an important step that we make sure that all of our teas go through. So anyway, Jill, what is tea? It says right there. OK, we're good. <laughs> Have a drink. No. Well, there's two main varieties. Um, so the Camellia sinensis sinensis is mostly found in, well, they're both um, found in China. But mainly, um, the sinensis variety is native to China, and m almost all Chinese teas are from that variety. The um, Assamico variety is native to Assam, India. Um, you can take any leaf from either of these varieties, and there's other varieties out there too. Um, Cambodia has its own variety, and there's like many varieties, like in little in mountain areas, each little area will have its own um, specialty. But you can take any leaf from any of these varieties and get any kind of tea, black tea, white tea, oolong, any tea, green tea. Um, normally, the Assamica is used for black tea because it's a little bit more robust than the Sinensis. The Sinensis tends to have a more delicate flavor, um, so it's often used for the white and green tea. But really, you can take any leaf and make any kind of tea from it. And I think that's a really important point that we drive home at Tea House because a lot of people, which we'll talk about health and all that in a little bit, but we often get that question like, well, which tea is the healthiest? And I'm like, guess what? Don't matter. Um, so this is the important part of what makes tea, which tea, what type, or which tea plant into which tea that you're drinking. And it's the level of oxidation. And that's the most important thing. So if you think about, like, if you get an apple or a banana, and you make a really clean cut, it's gonna have some slight oxidizing. It's gonna turn brown. If you mush it up, it's gonna get really brown because you're breaking down the cell walls. You're allowing oxygen molecules to enter the cell walls. That will then oxidize and turn brown. So it's the same thing with tea. If we wanna minimally oxidize tea, we're going to have, we don't wanna bruise the cell walls as much as we would for a black tea. So I'm just gonna show you a little. So. This is the closest thing to like a full tea leaf. Just trying to find a few that I have. So this is basically what most of the, a full tea leaf will look like. And this tea leaf has, not, has been very minimally oxidized. This is a, technically an oolong, but it's a very, very green oolong. So the only oxidation that has occurred with this one is the rolling of it. Um, so this, I'm gonna pass this around, but just so you know, this is, one teaspoon of this dry, and that's about one teaspoon of it wet, which will go into why you have to brew it properly. But um, just to kind of give you an idea of what a tea leaf looks like. Uh, so basically, I, you know, again, I can pick any tea leaf from any plant in any country, and at that point, I can say, huh, I have this beautiful tea leaf. What kind of tea plant do I want to make, or what kind of tea do I want to drink tonight? Or <laughs> not tonight, it probably takes a little longer, but yeah, you can. Um, now, oolongs you can do right away. <laughs> but uh, so you can, you, there's CTC, which is cut, tear, curl, 
which are really tiny pieces, and that's often a black tea. There's rolled teas, there's hand rolled teas, there's all different, there's cut teas, all different ways, and that's all to get the oxidation level that we want it. Now then we have to stop oxidation, obviously. So those of you who cook, I'm guessing a couple of you might be into cooking here, um, you can do a couple things to stop oxidation. What's one of the things you can do? This is the part. You can refrigerate. What else can you do? Yes, refrigerate. Juice, at like acid. Yeah, acid. You can change the pH using acid. Vacuum. Vacuum. Yeah, we don't, we can't really do that with tea, but yes, you can also vacuum pack. So you guys are all like way too advanced culinarily. I'm like, yes, well, well when I sous vide my tea leaf, no. I was thinking more along the lines of like, you know, cauterizing the cell walls or pouring citric acid over it. So um, we don't want to pour citric acid or lemon juice or anything all over our tea leaves. So we have to cauterize those cell walls with heat. So if you think about um, the best way to do that is going to be if you caramelize something or if you blow torch it or whatever, or if you put it in the pan, um, you're going to caramelize it much quicker. So with the tea leaves, that's exactly what we're doing as well. Different cultures, different ways of doing that, but that's the most important thing. Once we hit the level of oxidation we want, we have to stop the oxidation. The only way we can really stop the oxidation with tea is to either roast it, steam it, smoke it, depending on the type of tea. So black teas are going to be like that apple that you leave on the counter for a really long time. Green and white teas might be that apple that you leave there for like an hour. And then your kids go, ew, and they're like, oh my god, just cut it off, eat it. <laughs> um, not that my children would ever whine. Um, <laughs> so here's another picture of the different levels of oxidation, just to give you an idea. So if you guys ever have questions, literally just ask, because we have so much information, because, and oh, I mean, really, guys. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> yeah, that was plug number one. I got three more to go. Um, no. <laughs> Um, yeah, really, just ask us, because we are not super formal, as you can tell. Um, so I think this is really good, uh, important information. So obviously, we all eat apples. We go to the farmer's market. We are blessed in Ann Arbor to have, or whatever, to have the oldest um, farmer's market in America. Everything that is sold there has to be produced within a certain amount of miles. We're very lucky to be the second largest agriculture producer in the U.S., California got us beat, but they're going to fall off anyway. So we're, we're going to be number one soon. Um, so I feel like we all know you have different types of apples. Some are better for baking. Some are better for, for whatever, making jam, not pickling. Sure. <laughs> yeah, pickled apple. Sounds great. Um, and, and it goes for the same, or different growing seasons. You know, one year you'll have a lot of rain, so certain apples that you usually like, you're like, it's kind of mushy this year. Why? Well, they might have had too much rain, or maybe they didn't have enough rain. Or, and so all of these go into it. And I think um, Jill, especially in a lot of her uh, more in-depth research, has found that it can be as little as just a couple percentage points of um, rain versus drought difference from one year to the next. So again, talking about the tea that we're talking about, uh, we have p um, customers who, I just said patient, we have customers who come in and be like, you know, I got the scented from you this time last year and it was so different. I'm like, yes, because it's good and it's going to change. And it's not like a Lipton that they re, they will re-blend Lipton up to 20 times a day to, to make sure that, or all the British tea bag tea, it will be blended so many times because they want it to be consistent and always taste the same. My tea's not going to taste the same from season to season. It's just not. So um, it will be quality. But there's teas also that you have a year where maybe the agricultural practices aren't great in a neighboring garden. And maybe that neighboring garden sprayed and used pesticides. Well, if there was some really bad downwind or some rainfall that came into the garden that I'm buying from, it doesn't pass any of the testing, even though it might still be organic. I won't carry that tea anymore. Especially in certain areas, the agricultural practices, a lot of issues of, well, just too much farming and different, I would say ethical issues probably in farming have made certain areas very hard to find. I would say like Assam and Darjeeling because of very, well, I mean, you can, she wrote a really good blog about that. You can talk about like some of the... Assam and Yeah, Darjeeling. Assam and Darjeeling. Yeah, so that's where climate change is really hurting the tea industry. Um, places like China are doing pretty well, but with Assam, Ken Kenya, um, 
and Darjeeling, they're really on the level where precipitation changes really affect the tea. So in Nepal, neighboring Nepal, which is, you know, right, their tea growing area is right next to Darjeeling. Um, they're actually, one garden is growing the tea higher, at a higher altitude than tea actually likes, just to kind of get ahead of the climate. Um, in Darjeeling, you're having a lot of drought, besides all the political stuff going on, and the worker strikes and all that, you're having a lot of drought, and this is a very, very old garden. So the tea plants aren't as healthy as they used to be. So they kind of need some help. And when you have a drought in old tea plants, that help is usually in the form of chemical fertilizers just to keep the gardens going. And they're also seeing you know, a lot of people leave the gardens so they don't have the workers to maintain the gardens, to you know, prune them properly. And then with the strikes, the plants got out of, you know, out of shape. And it takes years to prune them back and to get them healthy enough, especially in the face of drought. When you have drought, you also have pests. And when um, pests bite the leaves, um, the leaves, especially the emerging leaves, have a lot of caffeine in them to kind of protect the plant from the pests that are biting it. So when a pest bites a leaf, the leaf releases different chemicals trying to ward off the pests. So you have a different change. Um, you have a change in the molecular structure of the leaf and your tea is going to taste differently. And it may not taste the way they want it to taste. So again, all these little things kind of add up um, to kind of jeopardize the tea industry. In Assam, it's a very low-lying area, and they have the river that um, hasn't been well-maintained. So you have a lot of erosion, a lot of silt, which leads to a lot of flooding. So a lot of the workers don't have a place to live because their villages are being flooded. And um, this, then it also is flooding the tea plantations. And they can't, uh, tea kind of needs a, the right amount of rainfall. If they get too little or too much, they suffer. So um, there's a lot of people saying, you know, we, we're not sure how long these industries are sustainable in these areas. Um, in southern India, they have also a lot of drought and intense rainfall cycles. And they've just kind of given up. Like in Darjeeling, they're required to grow tea. They can't grow rutabagas or something. But in South India, they're just like giving up. They're like, we can't do this. These crops are too um, sensitive to these drought and rain cycles. So they're just growing ro more robust um, crops. So you're going to get fewer fewer tea varieties from those areas. Kenya, the same thing. They have so much drought. So they're looking at different ways to fertilize, um, different ways to do kind of smart irrigation. Um, in India, actually, they've worked with NASA to kind of get satellites to kind of figure out where they could do irrigation that would be more effective in the face of drought and intense rainfall. So, um, the tea research, um, is it Takla? The tea research, um, yeah, I know that's my yeah, acronym, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they actually are so underfunded. They they were working with NASA extensively, and they're so under underfunded that they are actually suspended research for right now until they get more funding, because they they were trying to figure out how to make tea more sustainable. And a lot of that is also going aside. So setting aside even all of the obvious global warming things that doesn't exist because I read a meme once. Um, uh, <laughs> the, we also have the issue of like third, second and third generation farmers. The kids are going to the West, they're getting educated in the West, and they don't want to go back. Um, so they're selling off a lot of these smaller, more independent gardens to huge conglomerates, and they don't have the same ethical standards to not use the chemicals in the ground to make up for the drought conditions. Um, they don't necessarily have the best of reputations for some of the um, you know, fair trade type of issues. And so for us, Darjeeling and Assam's, I don't even put the name of the gardens often anymore on the tins because every time I order, I don't know exactly which garden I'm going to get. Because we do have these strict quality controls, I might be able to get 20 kilos from a specific garden. 20 kilos isn't a lot. I mean, it's 45, 50 pounds. It's not a lot of tea. Um, and if you think of like how many, you know, how many leaves it takes to make that just for my tea store. And so I'll get 50 kilos from one you know, tea garden and then we'll change the name and we'll put the new name up there. And then I order again 
and that garden didn't pass, or that garden didn't grow enough, or that garden you know, was sold off, whatever, and then the next shipment I get, I'm like, okay, so now it's this garden, and it might be next door, or it might be further up the mountain. We are getting a lot more teas from Nepal, because as Jill said, they're growing it at an elevation that normally isn't great for tea, but in the long run, with the changes, maybe it will be better. Um, then it, we have, for example, in New Zealand, there's a, a tea garden, we have some tea from New Zealand that is done in a biodynamic, biodynamically grown in almost like a sphere. Um, it's actually a little creepy sometimes when you see the workers because they're wearing like hazmat suits and they're going, oh, oh. I'm like, okay, is it the Martian or is it a tea plant? I'm not sure, but, um, and you know, so there, I mean, there's different industries, but they have more money and they have the access to the research to do that. Whereas in um, other places like Darjeeling in India and Assam, the resources aren't necessarily there. So. Um, yeah, people come in and be like, well, I used to get this tea. I'm like, yeah, that was like six months ago. <laughs> Whatever. Get with the game. <laughs> um, but it's frustrating for us because I would say like probably two out of our five favorite teas within the last, what, three years? Yeah, we can't get them. We can't get them anymore. So it's really frustrating. And people be like, oh, that was my favorite tea. We're like, yeah, we know. Because um, it's ours too. So if we're talking about China, so I will say, so we brought... Um, everyone always asks what our favorite teas are, so we kind of, that's like asking which is your favorite kid, and you're like, dude, you can't ask me that, they're right here. Um, I mean, we all know, no, I'm just, <laughs> 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 I'm just I'm kind of sort of joking. It's, um, but we did bring some teas over there, we have a, um, a milky jade, so I think that's always going to be in yeah. July's top yeah. three, for sure. Definitely. And it's technically an oolong. It's this oolong that I just showed you guys. I'll just pass out just while we're talking. You guys can kind of look at it. Um, so I have two. <gasps> can I go down? Am I going to explode? Is it like hot lava? OK. <laughs> so there's the wet, and there's the dry. All right, so this tea. The oxidation is stopped by steaming it over vats of milk. It's still lactose free because it's just the steam, so it has this amazing creaminess, and I would have to say that it is always in our top three favorites, so yeah. Um, but I brought this, even though it's not a green tea, which is the more traditional type of tea for China, um, we did bring this one because we knew someone was going to ask what our favorite tea is, so we're like, we're going to just make sure you guys don't have to. Um, and if you guys would like to try it, I forgot to turn them around, but the one that says Milky Jade, while we're speaking, you're welcome to just kind of, pss, pss, I would say, you know, don't take too much of each one because I only brought four liters. Do the math. Um, uh, but, or you can wait until we're finished. That's fine. Uh, but I just wanted to bring a tea from China that also happened to be one of our favorites. Although Lung Ching Dragon Well is probably also one yeah, of Jill's yes. absolute. So if you want to take the one that thing. says near the Milky Jade thing and turn it around, yeah, that's the one. Don't turn the other ones around. Don't cheat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we'll just keep talking while y'all are getting some tea. That's actually what I'm drinking. Now, the cool thing about that Milky Jade is that I am drinking the third infusion. No <laughs> electrical <weariness>. equipment here. <laughs> <sighs> He's never going to invite me back. Good. Thank you. So this one is oxidized kind of around this-ish level. So you'll find oolong teas that are about this green, and you'll find oolong teas that are almost fully oxidized. Um, it, but this one is definitely on the greener side, and it's really excellent. This is just pretty picture to show while we are drinking tea. So, all right, for the longest time, I would not do an aroma wheel because I'm like, how many wine tastings have you been to? And then you feel like a complete idiot because they're like, Okay, the person up there is saying really big words, and I swear it just tastes like wine. <laughs> and then you're like, and then you look at the person you're with, oh, like, yes, I totally get that chicory note. You're like, yeah, me too, chicory. Um, I bought it because the label was cool. Uh, so <laughs> so that, that's how it goes. So, but I, for the book, plug number two, for the book, which is available, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> We, um, we decided we needed to have a tasting wheel. And so this is, this is kind of like, you can really break down these flavors. And you can definitely see where 
sommeliers like myself come up with this total of what sounds like BS, and you just sit there going, uh huh, yeah, I taste that. Um, it's not to make you feel inferior. Um, it's because it does help you. And when you come into buy tea, and then we can narrow it down. Do you like a spicier note? Do you like an earthier note? Do you like a more woody note? Um, so as a trained palate, I'm not a huge alcohol drinker, even though we do now have our liquor license and make some amazing tea-infused cocktails, by the way, at Tea House. Um, I've worked with a lot of breweries and distilleries. Well, they'll just send me unmarked bottles of things that they've tapped, and they'll just ask me for my tasting notes. They like that I don't necessarily drink a lot because I can just tell them what I taste. So it's really fun. I have all these bottles with corks on them with numbers on them. <laughs> People are like, what's that? I'm like, oh, but it's probably like a $120 bottle of whiskey, but whatever. <laughs> Put it in the buttercream. Um, so uh, we have a lot of that. Or I just did, I just had the best time with um, Duncan, the head brewer at Grizzly Peak, because he wants to, he's doing a beer with one of our teas in it. And I actually hate beer which he loves. So now he has me try all of his beer because he's like, you hate it, just tell me what you think. Um, because that I'm not biased as to the type of beer. I can just tell him literally what I taste. So I've now twice had to have beer for breakfast. <laughs> um, it's fun. Uh, but so I don't know, like with here, do you taste any of these notes? Jill, what do you taste? I want to tell you something about tasting. So I do not have a very refined palate, and I've learned a lot since working at Tea House and watching Lisa and Phil from Mammoth Distilling work. What I want to say is when you see like any of these labels, if you don't get that, that is totally okay because you may think, she may say chicory, and I may say something completely different because I'm tasting the chemical. And I'm relating it to, this, to the food I last had that I tasted that chemical. Mm -hmm. And that will be different than what she tastes. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, your taste buds are all individual. So whatever, you, whatever word you want to put on it is exactly right. Yeah. And don't be intimidated by all of these labels. And the wine labels is advertising. It's totally advertising. It's like made up. <laughs> so, so if you taste jammy notes, fine. But if you don't, that's fine too. And, I think, <laughs> and that's what probably sets me apart from a lot of the other tea sommeliers is that I, I, I just want you to like the tea that you're drinking. Um, and so, and that's the same with like, I had no idea that, is it bananas and pears are the exact same chemical composition. So like it, someone might be like, oh, it kind of tastes like bananas. And someone else said, oh, it kind of tastes like pears. You are actually both 100% correct because it is literally the esters and all of the composition, a banana and a pear is the exact same thing, which I learned from all of my adventures in whiskey. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> like, darn it, I kind of sort of like it now. Mm. But um, so this is just kind of a reference for people. And I think it's fun, like when you go to tea tastings, it's kind of fun to, um, it's kind of that joke where you laugh at, but you have really, you're like, ha, ha, and then like a week later, you're like, oh, I get it. Oh, yeah, no, I get it. Um, and that's kind of my approach to tea, is that you should drink what you feel pairs well with what you're eating and in the mood that you're in. Um, we do have tasting notes that we offer. When you go to do a, a formal tasting, um, so as a tea, so a tea sommelier, it's a four-year training. A tea master is um, a 10-year training. And you'll have sometimes up to like 100 teas just set out. And you first rate it by appearance. And then you go back through and you rate it by um, like the leaf, the dry leaf. And then you go back through and you rate it by the smell. And then you go back through and you rate it by the flavor. And you rate these teas and you just kind of push them aside. And when you watch a tea master go to a buying trip, for example, like when I was in Japan doing consulting, they, they, watching them go on buying trips, they'll go through 100 teas and narrow it down to three within just like less than an hour. Um, because they know exactly what they're looking for, they know exactly where they want it to fall on their tongue, where what, you know, bitter falls in the back, the sour falls on the side, you know, all the different place, places, and they'll tell you, oh, nope, I didn't get it until the end, I want this one tea to be, you know, tasted in the beginning, and, and so on, do I want it to linger, do I not want it to linger, and so those are all the things that you can put in your tasting notes, and it is also helpful then when you come back in, because we say, well, do you like, for example, a Darjeeling, which we'll t I think we have, nope, we're gonna, I'm gonna skip to Japan, sorry guys, because we're going to go first, we're going to go to India now. Um, so like when you come into the store and you say, well, I've heard about Darjeeling. And we will always ask, my staff will always ask, well, do you like first or second flush? And you're like, <laughs> 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 uh, um, so 
that's very commonly asked for that specific, uh, specific type of tea because a first flush is picked earlier in the season, a second flush is picked later in the season. And it makes a huge difference, the same exact plant, when it's picked. So for example, a first flush is going to have a very dry palate feel. Um, I relate it to a greener banana. You know how sometimes you need a green banana in your mouth kind of yeah? That's a first flush Darjeeling. A second flush Darjeeling is gonna be a little nuttier. It's gonna be a little warmer. So it completely depends. This is when we get into tea and food pairings because that's very important. Like I would never pair a first flush Darjeeling with like something acidic or something. Like that should be done with like a hollandaise sauce. Something I would pair like a really dry white wine with is something I would pair, for example, a first flush Darjeeling with. So that's when we get into the same kind of crossover between like a wine sommelier does, or a wine steward and, and a tea sommelier. Because then we can start finding pairings and we can start finding consistencies and it, with, yeah, with which tea and which food go together best. And so when we do tasting notes, we often put little notes in that. So all the questions that my staff will ask you, well, do you know what you like? Okay, then we can break it down. You don't know what dark flesh, so we can break it down. What are you gonna, are you gonna be serving it with food? Are you gonna drink it with breakfast? Are you gonna be drinking it with dessert? All of those questions will get you down to like a perfect tea. And in the end, you may still not like it. So whatever, drink Earl Grey. Ugh. <laughs> Sorry, Joy. We even have a tea named after someone in this room, and I still don't like it. But, um, <laughs> but I love her. So I think it's important that you choose what you like to drink based on your palate. Yes, there are definitely things that pair better with other things. So if you guys want to try, again, sorry, I turned those around. But if you guys want to, while we're talking about India, and we talked about it a little bit before, if you guys want to try the Assam tea that is over there. Um, this is gonna be from near Mokabari. It's actually, right now I think it's Mangala. Is it still Mangalam? I don't even know again, because I keep changing it. But you're more than welcome to try that one too. It's a darker Assam, um, very classic, simple, straightforward Assam tea. Um, oh, and by the way, one of you on the bottom of your cup has art, because I'm a really good artist. <laughs> Does someone have on the, did someone throw away their cup with art? You have art on your cup? Yeah, you win, third plug. I mean, you win a book. <laughs> yes. In a dummy's bag. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they sent us bags. They sent us 20. I'm like, we could have a little more faith. We'd sell more than that. But, um, so don't leave without it. All right. And yeah, you're supposed to be like, ooh, what a beautiful picture. Come on, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so this is just a nice little picture. This is that's for Sri Lanka, um, which we, Ceylon, if you drink Ceylon tea, it's Sri Lankan. So um, just a, another pretty picture. So, and the aroma wheel, now that you've had two teas, we're going back to the aroma wheel. It's pretty obvious that one is very different from the other. Same leaf. Picked, these two actually were picked probably about the same time of the year. Two different regions, same exact thing, but look how different they are. So that's the cool thing about tea. And color. And color, yeah, because that one is fully oxidized, so that one's going to be really dark and beautiful like that banana your kid won't eat. So this is going to be the scientist thing because, okay, the three questions Two questions we probably get asked the most. Which tea has, or people come in and, I wouldn't say ask, people come in and like, well, I'm really sensitive to caffeine, so I need to get a green tea. Or, oh, I really want something healthy, so I need to get a green tea. And then I'm like, <laughs> I get to bust their bubbles. Um, or when they say, I love English tea, I'm like, oh, ooh, ooh. Um, so those are the two probably bubbles I like to burst the most. But I think it's really important, again, being the same plant. There is a lot of information in our book about caffeine, not that I'm plugging it, but it is so in-depth. So I'm going to have Jill just kind of break it down for you um, because it is an extremely complex thing. But in general, be careful is all I'll tell people because my most caffeinated tea on my entire tea wall is, in fact, a Japanese green tea. So um, I will let you... Okay, so all of these factors enter into how much caffeine is in your teacup. So 
White tea, for example, because I, like I said before, caffeine concentrates in the emerging, the new leaves to protect the most vulnerable parts of the plant. Your white buds in a white bud tea will have a lot of caffeine in it. However, you brew white tea at a very low temperature because the leaf is not oxidized, so it's very delicate. So you're brewing it at a lower temperature for less time, so you're extracting less of the caffeine because a higher temperature will bring out more of the caffeine. So how much caffeine are you getting? Well, it's hard to say. Um, if you have a CTC, um, Lisa talked about that before, where they chop up the leaves into very tiny bits, that's usually a black tea. But because you have all that surface area, when it hits that hot water, all that caffeine is going to come out really quickly, and you're going to get a huge jolt of caffeine in that tea. So you can't look at a tea and say it's going to have more or less caffeine than any other tea. The, the good thing about tea versus coffee, when you drink a cup of coffee, that caffeine goes right to you. And caffeine, 100% of the caffeine you ingest is available for your body to use. You can smell coffee and you're already getting the caffeine in your system and it's having a physiological effect in your body. But tea, the tea, ha the tea leaf has a lot of polyphenols, which you've all heard about, the antioxidants, is, which is why everybody says drink tea. Those polyphenols bind with the caffeine. So they let that caffeine um, extract a little bit, or you, um, when, it comes, when you ingest it, it binds with the caffeine in your body, so the caffeine is released to your body in a more controlled way. Also, tea has an amino acid that's found only in tea leaves and in like two different mushroom species, L-theanine. And the L-theanine works together synergistically with the caffeine. So caffeine gives you that, you know, I'm alert, I'm awake, I'm in a good mood, but then you get jittery. But the theanine um, induces the alpha waves. So if you do meditation, you want those alpha waves, which kind of give you that relaxed feeling, kind of calm you down. They work together, hand in hand. So tea gives you kind of that calmed alertness, which is really, you know, the only beverage that does that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, question. Question? Yeah. Does, does the way that it enters your system also affect how long the caffeine stays in your system? No. Caffeine stays a minimum of six hours in your system. So, and if you're pregnant, if you're on certain medications, depending on your age, that could even increase, which is why if you're letting kids have caffeine, you want to give it to them like early in the day. Like it won't stunt their growth or anything. There's really, excuse me, no harmful effects, but it stays in a child's body a lot longer than an adult body. So you don't want to have them having caffeine at five at night. Um, the, the thing about caffeine is it's very similar to adenosine, which is what it accumulates in your body and it sits on the receptors and eventually when enough is on enough receptors, it's telling you, you know, your body to start shutting down to go to bed. Um, caffeine, the caffeine molecule is similar enough that it sits on those same receptors and it blocks the adenosine from getting into the receptors. So it just blocks the signal to tell your body that it's time to go to bed and just keeps you awake. So there's no difference between the caffeine you get from tea or from coffee or whatever. No, not for how long they linger. It's more the effect that you feel when the caffeine is working in your body. That's the big difference. I don't know. Anything? Yeah, I mean for me just anecdotally, you know, if I do a tea tasting um, later in the day and it's a black tea tasting, I, f I feel very energetic. I feel like I can go take on the world. Um, if I do a green tea tasting, I'll be ready for bed, and then I just lay in bed. <laughs> All right, then. You know, so it, you still have the caffeine. It's just like, a, I just call it like a mellow caffeine. You're yeah. like, why can't I sleep? And you're like, oh, yeah. So, or like with coffee, I do, I do, uh, <clears throat> we all drink the C word um, in the morning. Not all, most of us at Tea House. My kids always call it, they're like, mom. And I'm like, shh. Anyway, but, um, <laughs> In, in, in the morning, like I, I like that initial jolt because my receptors are getting all the caffeine it can get. Um, so mid morning and like early afternoon is when I would probably do a black, you know, a, a, a green tea actually because the green tea is kind of will sustain me for the rest of the day. Or if I know I need to be up late but I don't want to be super jittery, then I might switch to that. But I think it also, I mean, it, it has caffeine. That's the thing. So and how you grow the plant, like Joe was saying, like all of those factors that we were talking about. 
affect it. So in Japan, the most caffeinated tea, I said that I have my well, well, like Jill was saying, if the plant is being eaten by pests or is stressed, it will produce more caffeine because it's a very bitter flavor. Well, guess what? Uh, if you want your tea plant to have more caffeine, you stress it out. So in Japan, they'll purposely shade or cover a lot of the plants just to stress out the plant. It will produce more caffeine. It produces a, just this rich, really rich, bittery, buttery flavor. Um, and they purposely do that. And that is like kabuse cha, for example. It's a shaded tea or a girokuro, which then also is used down the line to make a matcha. So our most caffeinated um, tea in the store is by far a Japanese green tea that has been shaded. Um, or if you really want the caffeine effects, then of course if you drink matcha, it's very different. That's a whole other story. We'll do a whole class on that next week. Um, <laughs> um, because that you're consuming the actual leaf, not just an extraction thereof. So, um, but we can talk about that a little bit. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, being a sommelier, can you be honest about, like, besides Earl Grey, are there teas that you really, really don't like at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard. It's, it's, it is hard because you're like, you know, people are like, well, what do you think of that? And you're like, mm, okay. <laughs> um, no. You're um, I am a human being, yeah, and and to, and to be honest, like I, um, some of the other sommeliers would totally judge me, but like at night, I want a decaf caramel chai. What up? You know, um, and so like, or a, an iced fruit tea or something that you know, some sommeliers would be like, well, that's not tea. I was just like, oh, whatever. I trained you, go away. Um, so there are very few teas that I really don't like. Now there are teas that are very very strong in personality, so to say, like a lapsang sushang, which is a smoked tea. It is extremely smoky. Um, I don't, personally, I, I don't drink a cup of lapsang, but I use it all the time to cook. Like it's my, one of my favorite ingredients in, in dry rubs, soups, everything. Same with pu'er, for example. Pu'er is the only tea that's actually slightly fermented, not just oxidized. So as a very, my kids call it poopy air tea. Um, <laughs> just to give you an idea, um, that fermentation does give it a little bit of an enzyme-y, mushroom-y, poopy air smell. Um, in Germany, they call it Nilfeldscheiss tea, which is hippo poop tea. Um, so that, but that, again, I don't, I would probably not be like, ooh, I want a cup of that. But I use it all the time as a base for like a mushroom soup, a vegan, like, um, it's got this hearty, hearty stock flavor. Um, so teas that I may not necessarily drink, I think have amazing qualities to cook with. And so there's that crossover. Yeah. Food, even if you don't drink them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and actually, like, um, have you also tr been able to trace the movement of tea, um, like over history? You know, because I've tried like Irish breakfast tea mm -hmm. and Kenyan tea. Yeah. And they're very, very similar. Well, yeah, because basically, when um, the Brits lost a little of their colonial rule in one place, they just picked up a bunch of tea plants and moved them to Kenya. <laughs> um, so there you go. Boom. It's not native to Kenya. Um, yeah, well, I mean, if you look at the trade routes, so why Germany is the largest tea purchasing country, if you look at the trade routes from the East India Trading Company, they had to go through that Dutch-German border. So Orange Pico has nothing to do with my tea being orange. Maybe House of Orange? Mm, I don't know. Look at history. But so they would be able to take the top best quality teas, just like the best spices and that type of thing. And then the next, and then it would get shipped on to England. And then it got sent to us in America. Yay, sweet tea. Um, so, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, oh, you can definitely, in, in our book we talk a lot about the historical routes and, and how the trade routes even um, really affected tea and where it's grown and how it's enjoyed. Um, and, you know, you, whether it's lore or, or fact, you know, there's so many stories on how specific teas came about. Um, but a lot of them you can trace just historically, definitely. Um, that's a whole, like, book in itself, you know, to be honest. Um, I mean, it was an extremely important commodity. So I saw a hand over here. Yes. So especially at your store, how can you, because there's so many factors that can contribute to the caffeine level, it, like, do, so do you say to people, like, here's a tea, you, I, you know it tastes good, good luck with the caffeine, or, like, can you kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to be able to tell someone? I mean, like, because... If we, if it's brewed properly, see, that's the thing. Like, I am never, I, when I see a tea company putting, like, ratings of how much caffeine is in a cup, I'm like, just don't, just don't. <laughs> or when they say which is healthier than the other one, just don't. That's all marketing. 
um, because I'm not standing next to you with a thermometer and a timer. Um, based on, if you're brewing a tea properly, then yeah, I can say in general, white tea will have less caffeine in your cup. Not in the plant, but in your cup. But if you brew that white tea at boiling for three minutes like you would a black tea, oh, one, it's gonna taste gross, and two, you're gonna be riding high. Mm -hmm. So um, I think if you, follow the, if you follow the guidelines, yeah, we can kind of give you a guesstimate, like yeah, this is gonna have a little less. And then of course there's rooibos teas, um, which is not really a tea, it's a bush from South Africa. There's the fruit teas, there's the herbal teas. I mean, there's other things that you can drink. And of course, um, a black tea that has a lot of things added, like dehydrated fruit or flowers or that type of thing is also gonna have a little less caffeine because there's other things when you scoop a teaspoon, there's gonna be other things there besides just tea leaves. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that, that, but if you like let my staff know I'm really sensitive to caffeine, they'll probably guide you completely away from the actual traditional tea plant. Um, so I think that's just kind of a general rule for us. I'm not gonna tell you how much caffeine, because again, I, I'm not, there was a little meter yeah. <laughs> oh, that could be a service. With every 50 gram bag of this $2,000 tea, you get a caffeine person meter person. <laughs> so let's see. Oh, wait, no, hold on. We're going to talk. So the last tea that I brought over there is a Japanese. I'm going to go back. Excuse me. Don't get dizzy. Um, I was very lucky, like I said, before the pandemic to be invited um, by Shiga, our sister state to go and help some tea farmers there because what's happening in places like Japan and, and also in India and in China is that the youth are, they, they, there's a Starbucks in every street corner. So there's very little tea being drank in these countries. Um, and the larger export companies are not necessarily following the best practices. Um, and so how, how do we help small independent farms be able to sell tea in the US? Is basically was the question. But also, this is a really cool picture because that one row is going to be kabuse cha. So when people ask, why is kabuse cha so much more expensive than sencha? That one row is that specific type of tea. Um, but anyway, so um, being it. It's just so much more labor intensive. Yeah, you have to cover it, then you have to uncover it, you have to time it, you have to pick it at exact timing. There's a lot of labor that goes into that. Kabuse cha. Cha just means tea. Um, shaded, so it's shaded tea. Um, that's me just taking tea. <laughs> that's one of my favorite farmers. He's really cool. Um, whoops. So if you guys want to try the last tea that we brought, it's, it's called genmai cha. Um, genmai cha is toasted rice tea. Um, it's a green tea with toasted rice. We brought that because um, Japanese teas can be a little on the extreme umame side of things, um, a little bit seaweedy because they are steamed to stop the oxidation process as opposed to in China where they are pan fried or like t walk, tossed in like a hot wok. And in India and kind of rest of the world, they are air dried. So just to kind of give you an idea about all the different ways. Yes? Did you say like CBD? No. <laughs> so afterwards, he's probably who y'all want to hang out with. <laughs> based on the questions asked. <laughs> <laughs> Staff parking lot. I'm just totally joking. We do not have any CBD. Um, they, in Germany, they do have like a hemp tea. It's so gross, but I know it sells well because people are like, ooh, it's hemp. Oh, it's nasty. Um, it's a lot of beverages, though, they are putting CBD in it. It's not something that um, we have done yet or will, maybe. I doubt it. I got too much going on. Yeah, so genmaicha is a steam, so it's a Japanese, very traditional Japanese tea. Um, it is um, basically a sencha leaf that has the toasted rice put into it. I really like it. And it makes the best ramen broth ever. So there's some recipes in there. We um, cook with tea all the time. I would say 90% of um, the food that I make um, and when we used to have the restaurant was made has tea in it some way, somehow. Because I look at my tea wall and I see 230 spices. So, so yes. So you use the tea, like the leaves? It completely depends on what I'm making. So like when I do a ramen, like a broth, then I'll brew the tea. Okay. And then, um, you know, maybe throw a couple. Like yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I just had some sencha that I overbrewed. So I made pickles out of it. Okay. Um, you know, uh, other teas. So we have a whole line of spice blends that we sell that... I just call it eat more tea is the other 
brand. Um, and those are actually ground up, you know, really fine into like different um, like dry rubs that you can either put in soups or you can use them as rubs or you can, like any other, when you go to the, the supermarket and you see like, I don't know, Bob's Best Barbecue Blend or whatever, it, it's the same concept. It's just they have about 80% of the base is, is tea um, and then other stuff. Um, and those are really finely ground and then you just sprinkle them on like you would anything else. Um, so like our lapsing spice is lapsing, 90% lapsing tea, but it has cumin and onion and garlic. And if you're making chili, it's everything you would put in chili. So you just dump some of that in and everyone's like, ooh, where'd you, oh, where'd you keep your smoker? <laughs> like in this little bottle. <laughs> um, so which one was that one? That's a lapsing, it's a it's lapsing, smoke, what do we call Sarcha. it? Oh, uh, uh, smoky, smoky, Sarcha. smoky, smoky. Oh well, my gosh, I totally know the <laughs> names of my own tea blends. <laughs> it's all that talk from over there about that CBD. Oh, um, so, does anyone have any, very, any other questions? Like I said, yes, please. Are there any native teas, plants that are grown in Michigan or the US? No, so there are a few gardens that are kind of starting to grow. Like there's one, there's a biodynamic or a hoop house one somewhere here in. Uh, in is it Traverse City or no on Traverse City? In, near one. Traverse City. Yeah. Um, there's North Carolina has some. Um, the in Hawaii there's a few, and I would say in 150, 200 years they're going to be great. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of these tea plants that we're drinking from have literally been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, and the soil is perfect for it. Um, it it's it, it, we're not there. I mean, yeah, it, but. It's a novelty, it's fun to get, it's fun to drink, it's fun to have, but it, it's, it, we're not quite there yet. Yes? Is it just like Labrador? Labrador, like the dog? Woof. No. no. But it's like non-actual teas. We have a lot of non-actual teas, but not Labrador. I was reading about it, and it's the tea that in Canada, wild, which is a native plant, they drank when they, during the wars when they could not get actual tea. When they couldn't, uh -huh. We have a mulberry leaf from Japan, which is the same concept. It tastes exactly like that. And then the wild blueberry caucus leaves, which it might actually be related to because there is a lot of the same, a lot of same species in that area of Eastern um, Europe and like Canada. So it might actually be very similar. Um, and it tastes exactly like Ceylon, like a, a black tea. So it could be, I'll have to look up the, and see if they are related. Um, but they might actually be if you, how you described it. Also regionally, how, where they're grown might be related. So um, I'll really quick, just a rundown of like how to brew the perfect cup of tea. I don't even know what time I'm supposed to like stop talking. So you guys just tell me to stop. Um, so we do sell tea bags for those of you who um, are into that. Um, these are great for like if you're traveling, you can kind of pre-make your own tea bags with loose tea. But what I really, really recommend is like, if we're brewing a cup of tea for someone in our store, um, you guys saw what this does, this huge leaf. You wouldn't want to shove that into tea balls. Um, tea balls are okay for like bad British tea, um, but we don't sell that, sorry, again, <laughs> zoom land. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, our spices are really thin, so they would probably just go through the, the strainer, but, um, but the spices you throw right in, like you don't need to strain them back out. Um, but so we just usually put the tea in a in beaker. I like glass because it's most non, like it doesn't do anything to anything. It's, it's just not going to affect any part of your beverage. Um, so I, you know, and you put in like a, a teaspoon, heaping teaspoon, depending on what you're making, how much you're making. I mean, we have instructions on our tea bag, but to be completely honest, you, if you like it a little stronger or weaker, that's up to you. If you want to con control the caffeine content, brew it a little like lower water temperature, less tea, less time. Um, you're also going to get less flavor, but sometimes you just want a little bit of, like, slightly brownish water. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but honestly, it's fine, whatever. Um, so you put it in here, set your timer, and we use this as a strainer to strain it into whatever vessel we're drinking from. At home, though, um, you know, people come to my house, and they're just assuming I have this, like, amazing tea set and this beautiful tea set. Now I have an espresso machine. Um, but... I have the one that I was using, I, I still have it, it's starting to tear here. It's almost 30, oh God, how old am I? About 25 years old. Um, and I just set, the, woo, I set this down into my cup. Usually I wash it, but meh. Um, set it down into my cup, put my teaspoon of tea in it, 
pour my hot water on it, take it out, done. Um, this gives it a little bit more room to yeah, expand. Well, how does that differ from when you want to use the tea for cooking? Do you brew it like you're going to have a cup? Or do you um, it, so if I'm doing a broth, I'll do a, a really strong brew of it and then, and then strain it through. Um, if it's ground up or if it's something I want to actually, like our tea spices are so finely ground, you just put it in. You don't strain it. You don't do anything. Some of them actually ground? Them? Yeah, yeah, we do. So, yeah, yeah. So that we have like five different tea blends that we have pre-blended um, with recipe cards and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of teas, like my son, my youngest, the one who was three days old, maybe that's why he's weird, but um, he, every day he makes something random with tea and it's always a mess in the kitchen, but I'm always like, oh, I'm so proud, clean it up. But, um, <laughs> but also like whipped cream, like <laughs> in our book we, we have recipes and we did a recipe for whipped cream and the lady who was testing, you know, whatever, recipe testing, she's like, well, could you give some more directions? I'm like, you put the tea in the cream, you put it in your fridge overnight, then you strain it, and then you whip it. She's like, yeah, but could you give some more instructions? Like, you whip it. Like, <laughs> really, it's that easy. So like, if I'm making a, a, a chocolate cake, but I want it to be a little bit special, like I, I can do raspberry rose. For example, we have a raspberry rose oolong tea. Put a little of that in the whipped cream, in the heavy cream overnight, strain it through, and then whip it then you have this beautiful, like, lightly scented, like, whipped cream, or like an Earl Grey whipped cream. I don't drink Earl Grey, but I cook with it. <laughs> it's so yummy. Or truffles, or anything that you use liquid in, you can use tea in. And you just have to plan ahead, because cold infusions are definitely better. Because um, you're not going to get a lot of the bitter extractions. But we make butters at Tea House. When you get a scone, you can get clotted cream or you can get a tea butter. And it's just literally I, I churn butter because I just infuse the cream two or three days in the fridge. And then I make butter out of it. It's actually really simple. Can you make it a cream instead of a butter? Yeah, you just whip it till yeah, it's whipped what? cream. Yeah, but then you just keep going. Then you got butter. You have to strain out the whey. But then you can use the whey in another recipe. So I'm crazy. It's fine. Don't listen to me. <laughs> or do, because it's fun. Um, but again, so like if you have a recipe, and you're like, ooh, these are really good brownies, and they need cream, huh, well, you know what would be really good? Earl Grey brownies. Put some Earl Grey in the cream the night before, they make your brownies. Super simple. So that's, um, does anyone have any more questions? Yes. So it really depends, again, on like what, in Japan, almost all the teas are mechanically picked um, because they like very, very precise uniformity um, in their tea. So their tea all looks very uniform, whereas um, white tea is almost always hand-picked because you're literally only picking those really young buds. Um, that's why price-wise, white teas are usually more expensive. I also don't have as many because they're usually dirtier because it is the top layer, so they're more susceptible to like acid rain and like you know, bad stuff um, from other gardens. Um, it really depends. Now, tea bag tea, 100% all mechanically processed. There ain't nothing fancy about that stuff. It's literally the dust and the fannings left from going through with big ass lawnmower, big lawnmower. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's both types. Yes. No, you can. It's, it's the same process, the CO2 process. I mean, Jill can talk yeah. about that a little bit more. What you cannot do, sorry, Reddit, is rinse the leaves to awaken it and to clean the caffeine up. No. Sorry, Reddit. <laughs> it's wrong. <sighs> yeah. You have people like, oh, I just like rinse the leaves and it awakens them and it reduces the caffeine. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, you've been on Reddit way too much. But... Yes, but yeah, they, you can decaffeinate. You can do it like they do. Um, coffee is water decaffeinated usually because that's the best for coffee. They do that with tea leaves, but you don't get a very good product because it we, it just dilutes the leaves. Um, our decaf teas are decaffeinated with CO2. It binds with the caffeine. They filter out the CO2 um, with the caffeine. Use that caffeine for other uses, and you have decaf key, um, tea. The problem with decaf teas is they can't get all the caffeine out so you'll still have some caffeine in it 
And also, it, it does degrade the leaf. So they're not going to use a really expensive, high-quality tea leaf and decaffeinate it because they'll just ruin the tea leaf too much. So they're kind of lower, less, lower quality leaves and because it degrades the leaf and you get a lower quality product. However, if you need less caffeine, you know, it's, it's okay. And a lot of the decaf teas, they'll use, they'll mix them with other things. So they might add botanicals and then you get a really lovely um, flavored tea that yeah. is mostly caffeine free. Yeah, and, and even the strongest cup of tea is gonna still be less than a cup of coffee, about one fifth or so, depending yeah. on, so even if you're, the, the strongest cup of tea that you can brew that is palatable is still gonna be less caffeine in the cup than a regular cup of coffee. So you're, you're, you're at least winning there. Um, but that's why, like I said, the caramel chai decaf, like it's my guilty pleasure because I know it's not gonna be the most stellar tea itself, but it has caramel and it has chai and it makes you feel nice. And so mm -hmm. that, that's, I mean, we do have an English breakfast, we do have a Ceylon and definitely it's not gonna be nearly as good as like a caffeinated one because you're also re removing a lot of the other things too, like the antioxidant and all those things that are supposed to be healthy. So a decaf green tea, Oh, sorry, just don't. That's probably the worst. Probably, yeah. yeah. But it has strawberries in it, it's fine. Yes? How would you, Rex, how would you make iced tea with uh, any one of your favorite blends? Yeah, so when you come into Tea House and you order an iced tea, because you can order any of our 230 something teas, hot, iced, whatever. Um, we do a double, so we're doing it on the fly, so we gotta do it fast. So we do, um, we, we do it double strength and then pour it over ice. So we would use double the amount of tea same amount of time, same amount of water temperature, everything, and then we pour it over ice. So you still brew it hot. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, at home, um, I, I'll sometimes do a cold brew. Sometimes green teas, more than four hours, are really gross, so you, have to, you do have to be a little bit careful with a cold brew. Um, when I extract it into liqueur, like for, into um, liqueur or into creams, because um, it, the chemical, the binding is very different, that you can go overnight or longer. But I see that she's coming up to my right, so I think she's gonna say, like, lady, you're done. Yes. We have cashmere chai at our store. Yeah, it's been our, one of our um, top sellers for like 15 years or so. Yeah, we have an Indian chai and then we have cashmere chai. What's the, what's the pink well, that not all cashmere chais have pink in it. Okay. Yeah, cashmere chai is basically in the Kashmir region. They don't have as much access to the sweetened buffalo milk, so it's usually just a lighter chai. That's really what, I mean, if you, if you go to Kashmir, um, it, it, it's just a lighter type of chai than what you have in India, but it can have any amount of different spices in it. There's not a specific one way to do Kashmir chai. It's just in general a little bit lighter than the classic Indian chai. So, yeah, thank you.